All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Uh, thanks for coming, especially uh, so early after the conference party. Um, as Alex said, my name is Thomas Christensen. I work at uh, U-Switch in London, where I get to hack closure every day, so highly recommend it. The Cognitech crew was kind enough to let me come here today and talk about, a, um, about my experiences implementing a declarative programming model in, in Clojure. Uh, the model I'm talking about is the propagator model. It's been handed down to us from the slightly more academic part of the Lisp community, where well, we're probably a bit more applied here. Um, before we get going, let's try and remind ourselves what declarative programming is actually all about. So one of the articles that this work is based on uh, defines a declarative language as something that requires only the statement of relevant relationships and the computational organization is specified separately or performed more or less automatically. That sounds a bit abstract, but some of it boils down to uh, the old saying, the uh, what, not the how. So we want to specify what we want to know, and we don't want you to really care about how it's calculated. So we all touched SQL. It's a brilliant example of uh, doing something declaratively. Um, in the closed community, there's a, uh, there's a pretty well-known declarative uh, library out there, mainly uh, CoreLogic, right? We all played around with it. Uh, it's big, built on Canon, which is described in this, uh, this book, The Recent Schema. And we've already seen some CoreLogic at this conference. Um, I've had a lot of fun playing around with CoreLogic. So it takes the, uh, the slightly hard problem of solving a logic puzzle, logic puzzle, it makes it much more difficult in that now you have to write a logic program to solve a logic puzzle. It's, uh, it's quite entertaining. You should definitely give it a go if you haven't already touched core logic. Uh, when you work with core logic, you sort of, it's sort of strange. You sort of start thinking, oh, it's very difficult to figure out what's going on. There's this magic box that you pour in your constraints into, and you sort of have to define your constraints using this slightly different notation, and it sort of seems like magic, and, and stuff comes out. It's not a very transparent model as such. So put, put stuff into a magic box, and you pull stuff out of your magic box. Um, I always felt like there should be some easier way to define this stuff, and just sort of modeled on my mind, and then I saw um, Sussman's talk, we really don't know how to compute. I think it was a strange loop last year, the year before, maybe. You can find it online at InfoCube. It's, it's, it's great stuff. And in that, he, um, he describes a, a model, the propagator model, for doing um, declarative programming. Um, but my sort of main takeaway from this thing is it's, it's very important to be very explicit about um, the expressibility of, of, of what we're actually trying to, to describe. We're not only trying to instruct a computer to do something, we're also trying to describe something to future programmers looking at our code. When we're doing closure programming, we are very focused on everything being very transparent. We want, we want uh, mutable data structures so we know what's going on. We shouldn't, we shouldn't throw away that transparency when doing declarative programming. It seems a bit of a waste. Uh, we should be able to reason about this sort of stuff. So um, I dug down into um, what this stuff was. And actually, you can trace it back to this article from uh, 1981. It's called Constraints. So it's a system. A language for expressing almost hierarchical dis descriptions. Um, and in this, uh, Sussman and Steele describe this, this tool for modeling different relationships. And the main, the main application in that paper seems to be on modeling electrical circuits and sort of figuring out what is the current different places in the, in the circuit, how does it act and to use that system as a, a teaching tool. Um, and it's also the, the main subject in Steele's uh, PhD thesis. I'm just going to read the title real quick, hopefully, which is called A Dissertation on Research Concerning the Definition and Implementation of a Computer Programming Language Intended as a Platform on which to create systems for computer-aided design of engineered objects based on constraints, a model for computation, combining a simple declarative semantics with a vivid intuitive visualization as a network of simultaneous active physical devices, computing in parallel without prior prejudice as to the direction of flow of data, using the technique of local propagation and augment by dependency directed backtracking for detecting and resolving global inconsistencies. <laughs> right. It's a good title. It's, it's very descriptive. It's, it tells exactly what it is. And uh, some of the things we sort of should, should pick up this one is it's like it's, uh, it's intuitive, right? It's visualization. It's stuff you have to, this thing promises you that you can see what's going on, right? You should be able to inspect your system, figure out well, how come these values are what they are, and how come the current here is, is what it is. Uh, this this uh, thesis in the, in the work was from a long forgotten time when people sat down and spent hours and hours carefully handcrafting uh, drawings to model <laughs> stuff and explain what's going on. 
Uh, this is the internals of a clock. You see there's different hierarchies where the components work together. And sometimes there's actually stuff that uh, goes across these hierarchical components. Uh, it's very, very fascinating stuff. Uh, again, if you're, if you're modeling um, like physical systems, it's, it's very interesting. Um, so after this work came out, uh, sort of the, the winter of AI happened. And we didn't really hear a lot about constraints. Um, but then in 2008, the author the propagator came out. It's uh, Adul and Sussman's uh, paper describing um, an extension or a new take on the constraints propagation model that was described 30 years prior. Um, and it's also the, uh, the topic of Adul's PhD thesis, which has a, you know, a fairly short title. It's only propagation networks of flexible and expressive substrate for computation. Right? It's, uh, the focus in this is more on taking this, this propagation model and extending it with new value types and, and supporting more uh, general computation, uh, I hope. It's actually here in the audience. Uh, Dave was kind enough to uh, point him out to me yesterday. So thanks, Dave. That's brilliant. Um, right. So let's, let's jump into what propagators actually are. Let's, let's you know, do the... Uh, the uh, the sort of teaching technique of showing you something you already know and trying to uh, abstract it onto the new stuff we're going to learn. We're going to look a bit on core logic. We're going to look at this relation and figure out how can we describe that in core logic and what's the same, how can we describe it in, in propaganda, the uh, propagator library I've released for Clojure. Um, so in core logic, we can use finite domains and state that a new logical variable P should be the product of A and B. Uh, the sum of P and C should be D. And then we can sort of start filling in uh, numbers here. And when there's sufficient information, if we read out D, we'll see that D becomes 10. And actually, if we want to model the same thing as with propagators, it's, you know, the semantics are almost the same. We're stating that the product of A and B should be P, the sum of PC should be D, and then we add values to these placeholders. Uh, and as these are declarative languages, it doesn't matter which way you shuffle these expressions around. You're just setting up constraints in your system. And it's not until you try to pull out information about your system that it actually, actually matters, which already did it. So it looks the same. The, the main difference is sort of under, under the hood. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's how this, this thing works. So let's take a look at how propagators work. We're not going to explain how core logic works, because that's, that's a two-hour talk. It's, uh, let's, let's do propagators instead. It's a bit quicker. So in propagators, the main computation unit is cells. So a cell either holds on to a value or it uh, holds on to no value. So the gray one doesn't hold on to anything, and the green one holds on to something. And the, um, the important thing is, as soon as a cell takes on a value, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the value it's going to have. Right? Once the thing is green, it can never become anything else than green. Right? Once a cell has a value, it's immutable from there on. Um, the way we put values into cells is either by just setting it, as you saw before, or using propagators. So a propagator is a a diamond here that listens to one or more cells, and whenever uh, a value of a cell is updated, the propagator is uh, informed, and it can then perform some sort of uh, computation, and it can in turn set the value of other cells, uh, which might trigger another propagator, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's an extremely simple model. Uh, of course, there's some you know, tricks to it, but this is pretty much all you need to, uh, to understand. So pretty, pretty simple stuff. If we um, look at this thing again, Actually, propagators don't have products uh, and uh, some rules in there, the same way as core logic does. You have to put them in yourself, actually. But luckily, that's actually quite simple. You can use a function for lifting a normal closure function into a propagator. So here, we define a new function plus, which is uh, defined using the, the, the normal plus operator. Um, this thing, the plus thing, will return a function that, when invoked on uh, three cells, say, observes the two first cells and always ensures that the, product, the uh, sum sorry, is in the, uh, in the last one. Right. So this thing will create uh, a relation, this propagator, between these three cells. Simple stuff. Minus works the same way. Uh, there's a bit of a trick in that if we, want to, uh, if we don't want to care about which cells we actually put values into, we need to make sure that the relations also go the other way. We need to play it backwards or run the programs backwards, as you do in core logic. To do that, we just, um, yep, there we go. We just ensure that the symmetrical relationship is there. So we put up two new propagators to uh, maintain that that cell up there is 
this other cell minus that cell, and so on and so forth, right? So, no. Just, just three propagators to ensure that all this is consistent. All right? Right. And we can do the same thing with product by using you know, uh, times and division and define products. If we go back to our example from before, that's all we need to set up the relationship between these cells. That's all the code you need, basically. Put in the values, pull out the values of D, and it'll be 10. If you try to put in a value of D that is not what the system knows it is, you just get an exception, and the, the system hasn't changed the altered state. All right. So again, it's pretty, pretty simple stuff. Um, so this, this is the method in which you sort of extend um, your relations in the, in the language, right? You, you take normal closure functions, and you just lift them up to propagators. So if you ever tried implementing your own collogic functions or relationships, you will you'll love this because it's so much easier. Um, okay, some of you have, all right, great. Um, there's a different way of extending this thing. So you just extend, extend, uh, extend propagators by lifting functions easy, right? You, but out of the box, it only supports sort of um, uh, basic, basic closure values, and you can't really uh, do anything it's extremely interesting. What's interesting is, um, is taking, and is to start to define new values in your system. So when I said before that once a cell was green, it would remain green, I was actually, I was actually telling a bit of a lie. So let's, let's see what, what that means. Right? So we can define new values. So let's, let's say we define a record type, define, uh, you know, describe an interval. So an interval is uh, something described by a low number and a high number, and all the numbers in between are, that's, that's our interval. Anyway. Now, if we, this is just an example. You can do any data type. You can do sets or maps or date time, whatever you want to do. If you have an interval in a cell and we, we uh, come along with a new interval and try to put that into the cell, we are going to succeed if and only if the intersection of the two intervals is non empty. And if it's non empty, the new value of the cell is going to be that intersection. Right? So here's three inter intervals. You see the intersection is the, is the bottom one here. And that will successfully get into our cell. If we have two intervals with the empty intersection, we're not going to write into our cell. Stuff, right? And we can define uh, normal rhythmic operations of this stuff. Let's say the uh, product of two intervals uh, is the product of the lower limit and higher limit. So every, if you take any number from the first interval and multiply it with any number from the second interval, you'll get a number in this interval. Right? Pretty, pretty easy stuff. So now we define a new operator. We can lift it into a propagator. And we can start making some, some interesting, interesting stuff. So there's one good example from the other propagator I really like, which is about measuring building heights. So we're going to go through that real quick. And uh, hopefully, that will give you an intuition about how, how easy it is to set this stuff up. So in the parameter puzzle, you're giving a parameter. Does everyone know what a parameter is? It's for measuring atmospheric pressure. Uh, we're giving one of those. And we're giving a building. And we're asked to measure the height of the building. All right? So, do you have any idea how to, to do that? Any suggestions? <coughs> yeah? <laughs> yeah, so we could give, give it to the, the caretaker of the building and say, could you please tell me how tall this building is, please? That's one way. That's not the way we're going to do it here, <laughs> unfortunately. So, bribery is out of the, out of the uh, question. Uh, there's another interesting way of doing it. We can, uh, we can take a parameter. We can take the elevator to the top of the building. We can hold the parameter over the edge of the building, let go, and it will plummet uh, down to earth and hit it with a satisfying sound. So if we, if we do that, and we measure the time from letting go to it hitting the ground, we can use that time uh, to measure the height, right? It's just a, the amount of uh, space it's traversed in that, in that time period. It's all the same, it's all the same equation yesterday in the vehicle uh, example. Right, it's just half uh, the uh, acceleration due to gravity times uh, time squared. Right. Easy, easy stuff. Um, and we, can, we can quickly set this up using our function from before, product. And quadratic is just product on product. Um, so the full duration relation states that the relationship between the time and the height of the building is basically what we have up here. Like it's g times 1 half times t squared. Uh, this is a helper cell for holding that product to the right. We just set up all these things. When it comes to putting in the uh, gravitational force acceleration here, 
we, uh, we put an intro instead because we don't know what it will be wherever we are, right? Because this isn't a constant across the Earth, right? We, again, we saw that yesterday in uh, the other talk. It's brilliant. It's just like a perfect layout for this one. We don't know what it is, so we're going to model this uncertainty and say, we know that it's somewhere between 9.789 and 9.832. We don't know what it is. So we put in intervals to model our uncertainty from our, from our world, and when we actually use it, we're going to do the same thing again. We make some cells for holding our building height and our fall time. We set up the relationship just by calling our function. It's just functions, nothing, nothing special. Um, we uh, measure the fall time to be somewhere between 2.9 seconds and 3.1 seconds, because you know, we're not that accurate. We just have a stopwatch. I mean, you know, we're only human. If we do that, we put intervals into our thing, we get intervals out, right? We know that the, we get the answer that the uh, building is somewhere between 41 and 47 meters tall, right? It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Interesting stuff is uh, when we start doing like, other ways of measuring the building height using parameter. So we could bribe, we're not going to bribe. We could, we could stand the parameter upright, it's a small thing down here, and look at its shadow. So the relationship between the, uh, the shadow of the parameter and the height of the parameter, that ratio is the same as the ratio between the building and the building's shadow. Right? It's just a model of a building and its shadow. That's basically stating that like, H prime, the height of the parameter, is uh, S prime, the shadow of the parameter, times some ratio, some unknown ratio we don't know. Depends on the time of day, right, where the sun is, if it's, if it's still light out. Uh, and likewise, the height of the building is H times S times, uh, is S times R, where R is the same ratio, right, because it's the same time of day. Yeah, pretty easy stuff. We don't even need to, put, to uh, shuffle around the terms because we're using declarative programming, so information flows both ways. So we can just say, I just need this relation to be true and this relation to be true. And the unknown here is going to be the height of the building, this h. But you know, that's just somewhere in here. We don't really, it doesn't really matter where we put it. But that's one of the nice things about declarative programming. It doesn't matter where you cut your relationships as long as you define all your relationships. So here, we just have the h here in the last position. And we use it, again, we're going to put in some uncertainty because even though we're down on Earth, we might not be uh, that good at measuring stuff. Right? We might not be that good at measuring the height of this parameter or the two shadows. So we're going to say that the building shadow is uh, around 55 meters, using SI units again, and the uh, parameter is about 30 centimeters to 32 centimeters, and the shadow of the parameter is somewhere between 36 and 37 centimeters. We put this in, we get out a uh, new height. Right? Cool. It's, not, it's not the same as before, so we have a new estimate. Um, so what, what do you do when you have two estimates of something? Right? You can average them, or you can combine them. Right? We, have, we have two intervals of stuff. We know the intersection is going to be a better estimate of both of them. And if we, if we just put in the two relationships, the fault duration and the similar triangles relation, at the same time, we get an estimate that is better, better than either. Right? It just falls out implicitly. We're not being explicit about taking the intersection, it's just for force out of, our, of the system we're building, the relationships we're sending, putting in. So this is just a code from before, combined in one that statement. So before, uh, the fall time estimated the building height to be 41 to 47 meters, and the shadow length 44 to 48. The intersection is what we get out, 44 to 47. All right? It's pretty cool stuff. We, we didn't ask for that, but it's, the propagators automatically um, makes our estimates better by revisiting values and trying to take the intersection of new intervals over and over again. Like it merges them every time there's a new interval, it merges them and alerts propagators, and once the system stabilizes, it stops doing that. All right, this is, this is pretty cool. Um, what we can't see, because I haven't output that value, is that information flows backwards in the system. Right? Without us asking for it, this information feedbacks into our original estimates. All right, so we estimated. Um, the height of this parameter, and uh, we estimated the time it took to fall down, the uh, parameter from the top of the building. Uh, now that we have a business estimate, that data can actually flow back into our estimates and improve those. So if we read out the fall time and the parameter height, we see that the fall time uh, is now like th somewhere between three and 3.1 seconds instead. Uh, we've, we've halved our, our uncertainty. All of a sudden, without asking for it, we get a best, better estimate from what we actually put into the system. That's pretty, that's pretty cool, just by adding uh, known information uh, without, without doing anything. Does this, does this make sense? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, you, should be, you should be excited. <laughs> um, 
Right. So you, know, you can use this sort of stuff. Modeling uh, is particularly good uh, at uh, modeling sorry, arithmetic equations and you know, doing, doing the stuff we saw yesterday with driving a motor and uh, measuring you know, uh, your system and trying to fiddle with your, with your inputs. So it would be really uh, well suited for that sort of stuff. Um, so let's, let's take a quick look at how it's actually implemented. So in, uh, in the original article, the Yarda propagator from 09, there is a uh, scheme implementation scattered around the, uh, the article. It's, it's great read, right? And the scheme implementation sort of has these mutable values all over the place, it has cells, it goes and writes to these cells. Um, if you want to do something like that in Clojure, you're going to uh, resort to something that is safe. So my first implementation of propaganda, um, I used references, right? So you have references for each cell, each cell holds onto a reference, and whenever you put stuff in there, you do it in a do sync. Uh, and whenever the propagators sort of mess around with your system, it all happens in the, uh, in the STM. Uh, whenever it tries to merge values, that's what merge up here is, it needs to have access to some function to do so. So you need to do a global binding whenever you start doing all this stuff. And it's, uh, you know, it's not extremely nice, to, to be honest. There's a lot of downsides to this. You have globally bound functions. That's not nice. You need to do stuff in a do sync, but there's no, there's no um, inherent thing in this solution that states that it should be, uh, in this technique that states that it has anything to do with, with software transactional memory at all. Um, these cells are mutable. Like if you read them at some point, and you read them again one second later, you have no idea if, if it's in a stable state. You have no idea what's actually going on. You can't see the propagators. Like the propagators are hidden somewhere. And once in a while, they're, they're executed in some, some magical cell somewhere. And there's no closure script support, right? Because you, you're, you're relying on uh, refs. It's not, it's not very. It's not very nice. So I took I took sort of the uh, the theories behind this thing and and gave it another shot, basically. So we uh, all of us who do closure, we know we know that what we're looking for is you know immutable stuff. We don't want to have like magical values floating on our system. It's weird. Like, we want we want some values that we can hold onto and inspect and and play around with. So a more closure uh, way of doing this would be to. Take, take your propagator system and make it into a value, right? So instead, in the closure's way, you, you just make a system, right? And then you start prodding at that system, putting in values, putting in propagators, and then pull out the values afterwards. So this means that the merge function is now inside your system. It's, it's bound to this thing. It's not magical globally, global binding. Um, your propagators are securely logged into that. They're not floating around in a, some, some weird place in your program. Uh, and you don't need the STM anymore, right? You can, uh, you can just take your system and, and prod at it, right? No functions, no STM, it's immutable, it's an immutable thing. Um, you can take snapshots of this thing, you can say, at, at this point in time, my world looked like this, and then I did some stuff. Right? But at this point in time, it looked like this. And also, having snapshots is actually, uh, which just naturally falls out of doing this, is actually like one of the major things that are in the other uh, propagator article. Is doing sort of snapshot thing and, and retracting facts and putting them in again and trying out different things. It's a, it's a real hassle to actually implement it. But it just falls out naturally of doing it like this. Like if you have a snapshot, it's just trivial. All of a sudden, I didn't have to do any work. All of a sudden, uh, just to get that. Um, but if you if you want to do like STM stuff, of course you can just make a system and and alter it at will. Uh, if you need to synchronize two systems at the same time, that is, that is possible. Right, you can do this thing, but it's up to you. Like, do you want to do that? Probably not, whatever you're doing. Um, and if you try to product it with, with inconsistent values, like our system from before, we know D is 10. If you try to say D is 9, you get an exception. The system is still stable. Nothing's, nothing bad has happened. It means you can do experiments. So if each of these blue circles is a stable system. Um, you can take your system and try and put in a value, and then at this point, you can try putting you know, one propagator here, maybe another propagator here, or maybe this is a value, and you're sort of just recording what happens. You can always backtrack and start doing, doing other stuff. Right? You can experiment and give your user the uh, opportunity to actually experiment and play around with this thing. You can also get an audit trail that's going on. Right? We want this to be a transparent process. We don't want you know, a magical box to just go out there, do some calculations, and, and give us an answer. In this, in this uh, diagram, the blue circles are stable, cool systems, right? They're cool because they're cooled down. There's no inertia in them. Whereas if we put a value in there, we might activate propagators, which makes them unstable, makes them hot. Uh, we might add new propagators that need to be run first, which makes them hot. But 
um, if, we, if we keep old systems around, like system values around, and ask uh, the propaganda library to do this for us, we get an audit trail of what's actually going on, and we can go back and inspect which values were in which cells at, at what point in time during my calculation. So, it's demo time. If we, um, yeah, it works. So this, this is running in the browser. This, is a, uh, this uses the closure script in implementation of propaganda, which is basically it's the same implementation, actually, um, to model the problem we saw before. So this is, this is measuring the height of a building using, using propagators. See, we start with putting in the fault time here. So all these are just putting in propagators, building your system without actually putting any, any values in there. Then you start putting stuff in. It becomes unstable. You put in the fault time. A uh, estimate for the fault duration pops up here, one we saw before. Uh, I lost my mouse. Brilliant. Um, and then it cools down, and it's ready for us to put in a building shadow, a parameter height, and then actually, the parameter shadow gets the first estimate. Like, we didn't put in this value up here. Oh, by the way, the span of these is the, is the range of the interval. So it's, it's scaled to uh, how large the interval is. Um, we didn't put in that parameter shadow up there. That just magically appeared, and we had no idea before we actually started looking into the audit trail. Right? Having an audit trail is super awesome. I, we didn't, we didn't know that we didn't need to put this in. We did. Then we put in a more refined value up here, which in turn gives us a better building height estimate, and then in turn gives us a better estimate for the fault time, right? A, a tighter bound on the fault time up here without, without us doing anything, and you know, we can inspect when this happens. And we can you know, branch out from any of these things and try doing other stuff. So. Um, So you should be asking yourself now, okay, so I know call logic, and there's, there's this nice, cool thing coming along called propagators. What are the differences, actually? What's the pros and cons of doing these, these things? So I'd say call logic is great at, at modeling discrete stuff. So you're trying to model a logic puzzle or, or some sort of set of ancestral relationships or an inference system or something like that. It's great at that sort of stuff. Uh, it can be quite painful to do arithmetics in it, I think. Um, and, and, and most of the stuff I do is, is mathematics, so I, I prefer doing it this way. On the other hand, propaganda is really, really bad at doing discrete stuff. It's not really, no, it's not really, really bad, but it's, it's not nearly as intuitive to model logical puzzles in it. You need to start merging sets, and it becomes quite hairy. Or you can do your own backtracking algorithm, which can be oh, sort of hairy. CoreLogic has this opaque, efficient search algorithms. It's quite good at doing, you know, um, Bread first search and giving us a nice results uh, extremely quickly. But you know, if, you, if you're not Bird or, or Nolan, you have no idea what's actually going on in there. Right? It's, just, it's just this magical box that uh, you put stuff in, hey, magic comes out, and I can run it backwards. Whereas the, the, the propaganda model is, I mean, it's, it's very intuitive, it's very easy to reason about, and it's very easy to inspect what actually went on uh, at each step in the calculation when values are propagated around from cell to cell to cell. Um, on the other hand, it's not incredibly efficient, like, because there's no, there's no decisions made to avoid running propagators that might not have any uh, effect. Like if you, the, there's no scheduling mechanism for removing propagators that are queued for execution if, they're not, if they don't really make a difference. That might be, might be interesting to look into. Um, so I'm not, I didn't come here to, to persuade you all from not doing core logic stuff. Uh, my, my objective was to show you there's, there's other declarative stuff than, than uh, logic programming out there. And uh, Propagator is just one of them. There's like a multitude of, of Java libraries for doing constraint programming. And if, you're, if, if the problem you're trying to uh, describe in your everyday work, if it's very difficult to actually model that using core logic, uh, but it sort of looks like a, a thing that declarative programming would be good at, maybe you're just using the wrong tool. Right? Maybe if you're, if you're doing mathematics or, or stuff like this, Maybe you should look into a different declarative model that would be better suited for, for modeling the stuff you're, you're working on. I mean, don't throw away CoreLogic, but you know, broaden your horizon and try, try some other stuff. Um, also, there's a lot of academic work out there. I just, I just stole this work. I just went out and read a scientific article and uh, found a dissertation, sat down and implemented this stuff without having to uh, come up with all these ideas. Right? There's, a, there's a lot of stuff out there, and this is a story we've heard before. This, if, you, if you read, Articles out there, and if you try to implement them in, uh, you know, in Scheme or Closure or in a, in a new and exciting way, maybe stuff falls out of that. Like, we, we got an audit trail for free, and we were able to do experiments. We were able to do all these cool things. We were able to run it in a browser as well. Like, how cool is that? You can run all of this client side. You don't have to uh, actually deploy it anywhere. 
Um, and, and all these dissertations, right, they're, they're written for people like you, like people who uh, do programming as a, as a living, right? And it doesn't assume any prior knowledge. It goes through all the basic steps to get you up and going. And when you use Clojure, you, you, get, you get leverage. You get all these immutable data structures for free. You get uh, extremely, an extremely supportive community as well. Um, yeah, this, it's, uh, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. Um, so as I said, this is a, this is a library that's, that's out there now. It's called Propaganda. Um, it runs on the JVM. It runs in, in ClojureScript. Um, there's a couple of tutorials for setting up uh, this building height problem with intervals. But as I said, you can use any data type. You can use sets where when you merge two values, it's just the intersection of the sets, for example. This is one way of interpreting that. Um, or you can use more exotic data types. You can use like Jota date time and intervals so to, to do you know, that's, that sort of stuff. And there's a couple of tutorials for that out there as well. So yeah, go out, have a look. Uh, yeah. It's located there, and this is my Twitter handle. Thanks. We have plenty of time for questions, so uh, except from you, of course. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, so you said it runs on the JVM, and it runs on the notion script, but does it run backwards? Yes, yes, it runs all the directions you, you, you like. Right? You, uh, in our example, like if we already knew the building height, if we started out with, with bribing someone using a parameter, and we didn't want to sacrifice our precious precious parameter by dropping it from up there, but we still wanted to know what the fault time was, you just put in that information and read out the fault time instead. Just don't, don't put values into the stuff you want to know about and see what falls out. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, and it doesn't matter in which order you specify these constraints. You just, you know, put in the stuff you know and see if anything falls out. If you haven't put in enough information, the system will tell you, I don't know what's in this cell because you haven't told me enough stuff for me to derive anything about this value the whole time. You need to put in you know, the height as well, otherwise this, otherwise this cell is just going to be empty. So it's you know, core logic both ways. Uh, yeah. Yeah? What's the most significant problem you've applied this to? That's a good question. So the question is, uh, what's the most significant problem I've applied this to? Um, so at the moment, you know, it's been, I mainly use it as a toy, but we're looking into doing some back calculations in some fairly hairy, uh, so I mentioned I work for you switch, by the way. We have a price comparison side, and sometimes you want to put in, you, you know, you don't know how, much, how many kilowatt hours you use per year, so you just want to put in your current plan and your usage and see what falls out. That's actually some quite hairy computations because you're sort of trying to, you have a model that goes one way, right? It's very easy to calculate uh, how much your energy bill is going to be based on how many kilowatt hours you have, but the other way backwards is quite difficult. Now we only need to model it like forwards, and we can get that out backwards. And we can use our model both to estimating your new price and extracting the hours you used on your old tariff. So that's sort of what's in the in the plans is uh, applying it to that sort of stuff. Yep. Yeah. 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 So the question is, uh, are there any situations where there's no convergence, just runs infinitely? And that, that does happen. You need you need to be careful with this sort of stuff. If you're, if you're doing stuff that is, keeps converging and it just comes, you know, and uh, you just get rounding errors that makes it, uh, uh, that never converges, that, that can happen. Right? So you need, you need to look in, look into intervals to figure out, or if, if you're modeling intervals, look into numbers to figure out, do I need to terminate whenever something is in within a, an epsilon border, of course, right? or something like that. Or you can just use, you know, if you use um, big decimals or uh, fractions, you can, you can get around it using, doing that instead. But yeah, yeah, it can happen. Yeah. But it tells you. It goes up and tells you, hey, you know, this, there's no convergence here. Yeah. Well, yeah? My apologies if you answered this. I was lost in the uh, thoughts that you were creating in my head. <laughs> That's um, good. Is there a way you can turn off that back propagation? I can imagine domains where, because I specifically measure that time fall, I wouldn't want you refining the numbers that I provide. Yeah, so the question is, is, is it possible to not refine the numbers going backwards? So, um, wow. Yeah, so, so lock them efficiently. Yeah, if, if so actually you, you would like to be informed that, that you put in information into a system that uh, is in conflict with what's already there, right? You would, you would like to actually get an error there, I would, would have hoped. Right? Because if you put in information that contradicts what's already there, please, please let me know, right? So 
it's probably not desirable, but you can, you can put in like constant propagators that just always ensure this cell has this value and own this value. This is possible. Or doing you know, custom merge, like you can extend it with this with all your own value types. You could define a value type that is, uh, this value type can never be altered. And whenever you try to merge a new value type with it, it just blows up, right? That is that's quite a useful trick. Yeah, cool, good question. So what will happen if you have a circular relationship? So these propagators are going to be um, alerted every time something happens, right? Every time a value changes from the existing value to a new value. If the value does not change to a new value, there's no reason to alert any propagators because it can't possibly influence the system anyway. So circular relationships are, are safe, basically, right? If, if, you, if you have a circle and comes back and tries to put the same value into the same cell again, you know, there's no reason to alert any propagators, it's fine. You just, you just stop your, your propagation. So don't worry, it won't blow up. Yeah. Doing that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like that particular thing will not blow it up. Yeah. 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 Cool. Yeah. One last question, maybe. Yeah. 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 So lazy evaluation of cells. That's interesting. I thought about that. Um, you. You would be able to sort of merge delay, but I mean, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't get a stable system then. The concept sort of breaks down. You, you, you can't really read your system and infer anything about it because you have no idea what the propagators are going to influence when they are actually triggered later without having some a priori assumptions about your system. There might, there might be, but you know, without, without a, an explicit model of which propagators influence which cells, uh, it's not possible to infer that knowledge and, and uh, lazily do this. I mean, you could just queue up the work, of course, if you're, not, if you're not interested in reading anything, and then execute it all upon read. But uh, on that, I don't see any way of doing that, unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Thanks. That's all.